Well, thank you very much uh, indeed for uh, inviting me to be here. Mm. What I want to do is to look really at um, three things. Um, I was asked to look at the relationship between development and stabilization. Um, and the way I've chosen to do this is to look very closely, um, first of all, at the link between development uh, orthodoxies and the stabilization discourse then to try and tease out some of the challenges that I think exist, and then finally to take a, a very quick look at uh, the new government's um, stabilization ambition, uh, as outlined uh, in the new, strate uh, new security concept. On the first of those, um, I think it's fair to say that, particularly since 9-11, the fragile state agenda has been seen as uh, presenting security uh, perspective, uh, security challenges as a major driver of uh, instability and insecurity, and also, also as a key uh, challenge to delivering the Millennium Development Goals. And the interest in fragile states uh, has become a, a critical foreign policy problem, uh, and one of the instruments that's uh, heavily used uh, is the concept of building state legitimacy through public service delivery. Consequently, public service delivery strategies, particularly in areas such as healthcare, education, water sanitation, rural infrastructure, have been conceived uh, as the building blocks of a developing a fragile state's performance legitimacy uh, and key in uh, delivering the fragile state's immediate survival uh, and for its longer term growth. Several authors also suggest that it can have broader transformative uh, effects. Improvements <coughs> in service delivery in one sector can spill over into other sectors uh, on both Millennium Development Goals and, uh, 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 and security objectives. The consensus around supporting a fragile state's responsiveness to a population's uh, expectations has also focused attention on governance issues, the informal and formal institutions that shape uh, individual and collective behavior. Therefore, improving uh, governance, community voice, and accountability uh, are recognized as uh, being as the heart uh, of an effective developmental state, strengthening consensus amongst different groups in society about how the uh, affairs of that state are managed. In other words, what we've seen is development starting to articulate a stabilization agenda. And development orthodoxies are not necessarily a competing narrative with those of stabilization and counterinsurgency. Far from it, they're overlapping narratives. And the counterinsurgency literature, uh, and increasingly the stabilization literature, uh, is borrowing almost wholesale many of these, uh, uh, many of these preoccupations. But there do exist serious points of, um, uh, of difference and conflict. I think it's fair to say that there has been increasing attention on um, the missing middle or theories of change that explain how activities lead to stabilization. And I think we've seen quite a variety of these. Development interventions are an element of service delivery and they're thought to impact upon perceptions of the legitimacy of the state. Development interventions build social capital that encourage governments into greater levels of responsiveness and contribute to enhanced legitimacy. They bridge the divide between belligerent communities or um, excluded communities and facilitate peace or ameliorate violence. Development interventions contribute to the protection of core institutions and people, a core component of the UK's stability logic, and consolidate stability, and very much on the military side, um, particularly with the Americans, less so with the, uh, the British military, but uh, uh, it's true in both cases, <coughs> development wins hearts and minds um, for the military as well. So I think what we're seeing is um, a securitization almost from within the development community. And this has been reflected um, very much within the military communities as well, particularly since the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. The fragile uh, state agenda has increasingly merged with aspects of the Western military counterinsurgency doctrine. Um, and development, uh, the provision of basic or core public services, a responsive state uh, accountable to its population, uh, building um, social capital, are seen as key components in counterinsurgency strategies. The combination of framework security, service delivery, winning the hearts and minds of beneficiary populations, and delivering additional security benefits, defined in terms of access to intelligence uh, and information that enhances force protection, 
uh, and frequently pitches uh, in terms of uh, broader attitude change uh, amongst uh, 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 beneficiary populations. So I think the point here is I would probably uh, disagree with Professor Menkhaus in suggesting that there are uh, uh, there are uh, their competing narratives. I think what we're seeing is a blending of the narratives, but not uh, not without tensions. Now, these theories of change uh, are not necessarily uh, 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 originating simply within the military communities. Um, one of the most striking um, uh, things from my point of view is how the health as a bridge for peace concept uh, emerged in the mid-1990s as essentially a sta stabilization strategy and how it's adopted within significant sections of the NGO community uh, and it even had support uh, within the, uh, the World Health Assembly um, and uh, parts of DFID as well. And the idea was that um, health provided a technical space in which former belligerents could agree on technical issues, and this could have a spillover effect, uh, persuading people as to the costs of violence and therefore deterring violence, uh, persuading people um, of uh, the uh, idea that they would be able to create ceasefires to allow particularly immunization programs. Uh, and that this could uh, spill over into a broader peace process, or finally, after conflict, performance legitimacy, the integration of um, health services from former uh, belligerents, uh, the inclusion of um, excluded, uh, marginalized community would undercut grievances. In other words, the Health as a Bridge for Peace program is very much uh, a forerunner to much of the military logic. So my point, I think, is a, a relatively straightforward one. Uh, and that is that the stabilization agenda has been converged on from multiple different sides. And what it's created is a, a, a model that's difficult to articulate um, uh, and is sometimes seen as uh, 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 very vague, uh, perhaps for some uh, a necessary response to uh, complexity. Different conflicts require different stabilization approaches. But for others, uh, it's seen perhaps uh, as a model that lacks, lacks clarity. I think there are a variety of challenges with stabilization as a concept, uh, and particularly its relationship with development. I've identified what I think are, are the five um, significant, although not, not exclusive, challenges. The first is that harnessing development in interventions to a broad array of stabilization and state building objectives may diminish the effectiveness of the development programs themselves. Um, there is potential for the stabilization and counterinsurgency agendas to change operational uh, development priorities, introducing distortions into the choice of uh, community beneficiary. So, for example, USAID AID interventions in Sudan in 2007 privileged one community that was perhaps subject to more, uh, uh, more risk of a renewal of conflict over other communities that perhaps had uh, uh, more challenges in terms of health indicators. There is a risk of a logic of short-termism in order to demonstrate success and to uh, underpin the uh, political settlement. The second problem, I think, is in the construction of a political settlement. Political settlements are notoriously difficult uh, to create uh, and not notoriously difficult for uh, outsiders to impose or to shape. Um, what is not needed is a grand bargain between political elites, and certainly we've heard Sheila describing how uh, bottom-up processes are, are essential. But bottom-up processes require a huge degree of knowledge of the social and political dynamics of a conflict state, um, which will certainly stretch the capacities of governments uh, and donors uh, to deliver. The third point is that the association between development actors and counterinsurgency and state-building agendas may limit access to beneficiaries and endanger staff. Uh, and this is a reworking of the old, uh, the old humanitarian space idea, I know. But quite clearly, um, it does politicize public service delivery. And there is a long track record of this. Uh, following independence from colonial rule in 1975, uh, the, 19th, uh, the socialist Mozambique government expanded primary health care uh, and education provision. And uh, this was systematically targeted by Renamo 
in Nicaragua and Peru, health posts in war zones were sacked and ruined in order to prevent access from what, of one belligerent uh, to those uh, communities. El Salvador, the mutilated bodies of health workers, um, were found with the letters EM, uh, excuse my pronunciation, but Esquadron de la Muerte, or Death Squad, carved into the flesh uh, as a brutal warning uh, to opponents. Uh, Timor-Leste, Chechnya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Philippines, Croatia, Bosnia, Kashmir, etc., etc., uh, are places where there has been targeting of health, uh, which has been seen as a political good rather than as a public service. The definitions, uh, my fourth point, of stabilization are potentially problematic. Um, they vary across the stabilization communities. What is the precise model? Can there ever be a precise model? Who is being stabilized and what is the international role in delivering this? Um, does it take into account the fact um, that uh, the external presence itself may be fundamentally destabilizing? The absence of um, a universal <coughs> definition is um, arguably something that the UK has worked, uh, worked hard on. Uh, the UK has quite clearly provided uh, a focus on the need for security as a precondition for development, the protection of pe key people and institutions, economic and political, uh, and uh, an attempt to promote the conditions for development. So I think uh, the stabilization unit is definitely pushing uh, in the right direction. But there remain competing policy discourses, early recovery, for example. Um, and stabilization as a concept also comes with political baggage uh, introduced by Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Uh, the early recovery agenda is a particularly complicated one. Um, early recovery uh, offers political advantages to humanitarian communities uh, anxious to avoid the political agenda that stabilize, stabilization uh, implies. The fifth point um, is um, I, I think Shay throwing uh, uh, Sheila some, uh, uh, some hope, uh, but that is that uh, stabilization, uh, development of state building para uh, paradigms are not necessarily incompatible. And often they are derived, as I said at the start, uh, from very common uh, experiences uh, and lesson learning. Uh, greater stability is clearly a precondition for development. Support to a legitimate government and external military intervention can help create the space for non-military actors to engage in state building and development. Um, and stabilization activities, as we've seen, are not necessarily inconsistent with development and state building principles. There are common priorities, effective institutions and a non-predatory inclusive political settlement, ensuring macroeconomic stability, supporting the ability for revenue collection. And at the sub-national level, the emphasis on supporting bottom-up uh, approaches to connecting provincial and district government to its people uh, is clearly something that many developmentalists would hold in common with stabilization practitioners. But uh, military invention does not, intervention does not automatically create that space. Yeah. Uh, and a limited intervention, uh, and particularly one that creates collateral <coughs> damage, can be counterproductive. Uh, are the military configured for stability operations, or will they always prioritize, um, because of their size, begin to dominate decision-making at the tactical and operational level? State building is not a universal model. Uh, in Afghanistan, a decentralized state uh, is preferred to a strongly centralized state. Um, the favoring of local solutions allows in corruption, fragmentation, uh, and uh, potentially uh, uh, elite empowerment, uh, increasing marginalization. Nevertheless, um, we also ought to look uh, carefully at principles such as uh, ownership and partnership. What do these mean in a stabilization uh, environment? There are also compromises that uh, will be dealt with very differently. Um, how do we uh, respond to spoilers in a stabilization environment? Would developmentalists uh, create the same uh, response? What about the compromises in human rights and uh, other normative concerns? How do you combat corruption? Uh, can you have functional corruption in stabilization? And how does that sit with the long-term development uh, objectives? And who makes these decisions? The final set of points I want to make, uh, moving rapidly on, is uh, to just have a, a, a quick look at uh, the new government uh, and potentially the new directions that we're moving in. 
I think it's fair to say that um, the new government has tried to deal with uh, a reconfiguration of British foreign policy after several years of, uh, of overstretch uh, and in the face of the financial austerity problems uh, that are all familiar to us. The National Security Committee met on the first day of the uh, coalition government taking office, sending a, a strong signal and work on the national security strategy and the SDSR uh, uh, commenced immediately. But what we also saw announced uh, uh, very early on was the uh, com Parliamentary Committee for Public Administration releasing a report uh, that the government in Whitehall has lost the art uh, of making national strategy in relation to defence and security. There have been criticisms that the SDSR was driven more by political and bureaucratic drivers, uh, capital legacy programs, than by sustained and coherent strategic thought. And certainly there has been criticism um, from the chattering classes in the military, um, or at least an element of them, that the government's ring fencing of DFID's uh, budget and the commitment to international development expressed as a share of GNI has not been integrated within UK strategy. Um, I think this, what this means is it poses a number of challenges for how you reconcile the UK development strategy with its security and stabilisation strategy. Since 2001, DFID has managed some 87% on average of total ODA. What will happen to this? Um, the National Security Council's recent statement that the ODA budget should make the maximum possible contribution to national security consistent with ODA rules um, also means that perhaps the pressures on development spending uh, are pushing in a slightly different direction. Will this skew countries? Will it skew recipients within particular countries? What impact will it have on other government de uh, departments' capacity to make decisions on uh, development spending? And I suppose the big question is, does this mean that in the last five years uh, of the MDGs, will the MDGs remain the most significant organizing principle for bi bilateral aid distributions? The final um, point I think I would make uh, would be whether the um, securitization of uh, aid that this potentially represents uh, will lead to additional pressures on expenditure and the need for deliverables and announceables. Will this um, skew uh, the way in which development money is um, provided? That said, I think there are some very positive things. The stabilization units um, uh, focus on upstream conflict work. Prevention, uh, in particular, I think, is a welcome, uh, welcome change and it's filling a, a, an a, a space which has long been ne neglected. Um, the National Security Council's uh, direction of an increased focus on tackling threats at source rather than uh, at the point where they've escalated to full-blown conflict or materialized on UK territory uh, is interesting. The expansion of the SU's remit is uh, uh, potentially good. But I think uh, the overambition which has characterized um, our stabilization interventions poses real dangers. Um, additional resources through the conflict pool, the prioritization of uh, some states which impact on U uh, UK security, uh, and finally the, uh, prior uh, the um, idea of a building stability overseas strategy are the things that I think we need to watch. Very good. Thank you, Stuart, very much indeed. <laughs>